Welcome to another episode of Code for Thought. Mentoring, the Cambridge Dictionary tells us, is the act or process of helping and giving advice to a younger or less experienced person, especially in a job or a school. Mentoring has indeed a long tradition and is well established in a number of workplaces. But with research software engineering being a rather young discipline, mentoring for RSEs has been a rather ad hoc affair. Well, until 2021, that is, when the Society for Research Software Engineering in the UK launched its pilot mentoring scheme. In late 2022, that is, one year after the pilot launch, I spoke with both the organisers of this scheme as well as one of the mentor-mentee pairs from the first pilot. Let's hear first from the organisers, Anya Brown and Sam Mangum, who'll give us a brief overview of the scheme. Hello, Anya and Sam. Thank you very much for joining me today to talk about the mentoring scheme. And before we go into this, could you perhaps briefly introduce yourself? Maybe you can go first, Anya. Yeah, my name is Anya Brown. Um, I've worked as an RSC in the UK, uh, in Oxford and in Southampton uh, for the last five years. And recently I've uh, moved to industry working in a a similar position uh, at NVIDIA. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm an RSC at Southampton. Uh, where I've been, again, for about the last five years, um, and I took over the mentoring scheme from Anya. So let's talk about the history of the mentoring scheme. Uh, When did it all start? From my perspective, it was around, I think, 2019 when we were starting to talk about this. Um, And it came up, at least for me, for the first time in an aspiring leaders workshop. Um, In Mm. that context in particular, that a lot of RSCs uh, were beginning to move into management and what it meant to be the manager of an RSC group wasn't really something that was known and a lot of people were looking for some kind of support there. And then for me personally, um, the idea made a lot of sense just because I think mentoring is a big part of the RSC community anyway. I think the RSC career path is weird and wonderful enough that it's useful to have someone to talk to about it. And a lot of RSCs are really isolated as well. From hearing about sort of talk of of a mentoring group from that point, I was interested. And then we ran a brief workshop and the 2019, I think, RSE conference to start asking the community what that should look like. And then from when I joined the RSE Society as a a trustee in 2020, um, we started researching into what a program could look like, um, who we could get help from to, to, to set it up. So I was involved in sort of designing the program and the very initial launch of that. And then Sam took over once the the mentors had been matched and looked after the program from them. All right. So that's a nice handover to Sam. Uh, So I've been involved since uh, 2021 when I became a a member of the the society, uh, one of the trustees. Uh, But thankfully, (laughs) my job was a lot easier than Anya. So Anya has, has clearly put huge amounts of effort into sort of the design thoughts and, and preparation for the mentoring scheme. My job was basically to sort of uh, sit there and watch it watch it tick along. I've been sort of kind of involved in, in renewing it for this year because it was basically a great success. But yeah, I, I basically just took over for Anya and, and kept it ticking along. It's not been without the occasional bit of problems. So one of the, the great ideas that was, was written in originally was the idea of having routine sort of career development meetings and, and training sessions delivered by the company uh, Coach Mentoring. But we've run to problems where RSEs have very fractured schedules. Trying to sort of assemble 20 RSEs in the same room at the same time was a little bit limited. So those kind of ended up under-attended and kind of shelved. So we're hoping to roll those out to the rest of the society next year, rather than just being just the people who are who are on the mentoring scheme. Let's roll back a little bit. So what I picked up on is that it started kind of in 2019. When you started looking into this, Anya, and then there was a workshop, and then of course the pandemic struck, so there was a little bit of a limitation of how many people you could meet at a given time, and then there was twenty one, which I think when the pilot scheme for mentoring started. Yes, that's that's when we launched, and I should uh, mention a few more names, by the way. I'm I'm sure I'll forget some, but there were a number of people involved at the start: Mojgan Kabirichime, Kirsty Pringle, Claire Wyatt in the RSC Society at the time as well, helping me with that. So you had the uh, pilot scheme. So how many people actually signed up for the pilot scheme? How many people did you have? You mentioned 20. 
Yes, it would have been on the order of 20 or 30. We deliberately kept things small. We were aware that we hadn't run a program like this before and we wanted it to be sustainable. We didn't want it to be something where we bit off more than we could chew and then the program only ran for one year. We sort of wanted to start gently, try to figure out what the best format was for it and and hopefully keep it running uh, year on year. Uh, So you mentioned earlier, which I found quite interesting, that RSE do a little bit of mentoring anyway, because we are quite a broad church in a way, but quite spread out as well. So as you quite rightly say, there are a number of people who work isolated, either in research groups, or they don't actually have specific roles here in the UK. And in other countries, I believe the Netherlands, there are roles for research software engineers, but not in many countries or not in every country. So what do you think that this particular mentoring scheme is bringing to the table that otherwise wouldn't happen anyway? Yeah, the mentoring that I had in mind that's already present in the society, um, I think there's a lot of short-term help, for instance, over the Slack or just informally in, in conversations, but there's not necessarily this chance for deeper sort of ongoing Uh, regular support for help with with careers and that sort of thing. Whereas the mentoring program is around nine months, that lets you really get deep into uh, some areas that you might want to work on. And I think the other important part of it is that it's, it was important to me that it be open to everyone, that it was a formal scheme and didn't rely on knowing someone in the community or where you sort of happened to work. Um, and what mm-hmm. connections you had, that you had to be a member of the society. And apart from that, you just signed up and you you were able to find someone. I felt like I benefited quite a lot. I sort of fell into working in the RSE community, but I ended up from the beginning working for people that were quite established in the community. And that helped an, an awful lot in terms of them being able to say, you know, should participate in this workshop or apply for this uh, initiative or just mm-hmm. giving a perspective on this is what it's like to be an RSC. I like the idea of a formal program where anyone can get access to it if they've heard of the RSE Society at all. Sam, what's been your motivation to get involved? Essentially, because it's a really good idea and somebody needs to keep doing it. I've also benefited greatly being sort of in the same group as Andy for a bit as well from having really good, really supportive senior management sort of happening, well, line manager rather, having sort of like good interactions Mm. with them having lots of encouragement about career development, that kind of thing. I'm aware that that's not necessarily a thing everybody can rely on. So I thought it was sort of really important to keep this going, to to sort of continue offering these sorts of long-term, close, supportive interactions to other people, be able, able to, again, offer the benefit of people who have been in the community for a while to new groups that have just started. Okay, so to build a formal structure and something a little bit more not more, but less ad hoc, right? So as you quite rightly say, both of you, there's a lot of interaction already happening on RSE Slack channels, but they tend to be on a on a moment basis, whereas this mentoring scheme is really to put this on a sound footing and build some relationships long-term between mentor and mentee. So now that we've run the first round of pilot scheme, so Sam, how did it all go for you? From my perspective, I didn't actually have a lot to do um, because the framework had been set up very well um, and it just basically just just went like clockwork. We did encounter a few problems along the way. So, for example, the original plan called for, you know, like the RSE Society to provide a uh, training session specific to RSE career development things and for the, uh, the coach mentoring, the company that we use to organize this to provide training sessions for career development things. Unfortunately, with only a cohort of 20 people, on the the side of the mentees it was really hard to find times that enough people could do to kind of make these things practical and feasible to run so by the end we ended up kind of having to drop these large group sessions even though the feedback from the people who could make the group sessions was quite positive so as a result of that we've tried to we decided that for the the next year we're going to kind of roll out these these group sessions to sort of the society as a whole rather than just the people in the mentee program but beyond that the actual relationships between the mentors and the mentees seems to have gone incredibly well. So uh, basically every single pair, with the exception of one, seems to have had a great experience. Uh, felt, felt like they both learned a lot from it, uh, with the only limits being essentially sometimes people aren't very available. Sometimes it's hard to get schedules to line up between the two. 
people maybe not having the, the freedom to be able to organize these kinds of things as much as possible. But a lot of the a lot of the relationships seem to have progressed beyond the the original course of the mentoring scheme with, you know, people remaining in contact far beyond the couple of months that were expected. Um, and so it just seems to have gone really well. Interestingly, part of the reason we thought we might need these group sessions was to keep the momentum going. Having not done this before, we were scared that maybe uh, without that sort of regular reminder of a, a cohort session, the relationships would sort of peter out. Um, but it seems like that didn't happen at all. And the the enthusiasm for it sort of has kept up. So I'm, I'm glad that the core kind of part of the, the mentoring program did, did go really well. Okay, so just to clarify, so that these large group sessions, like basically everybody in the cohort of 20 or 30, how many people you had, yes. was just to get into the mentoring scheme, but then the mentor and mentee would go away individually as a pair. We had some, in, some initial training sessions, which I think were very important for both the mentees and the mentors, uh, an initial training session to tell them what to expect, some advice, what might go wrong, who to go to if, if things went wrong. So those, fortunately, we were able to get almost the whole cohort for. But then we had sort of at regular points through the, um, the nine months also planned some sessions that were about skill sets in some way relating to careers, soft skills, those kind of things. How do people actually sign up? We basically have a, a Google form for people to sort of express their interest in, which has been tweeted out, um, included in the society newsletter and put on the Slack. There's a, an expression of interest form, which we're hoping to have signed up through that by the end of the week, uh, by the end of this week, which is the 11th of November. And then by the end of the week after that, we're hoping to have uh, the official sort of full details entered by people provided to sort of the, the coach mentoring, the organization company that we're using, who kind of try to pair people up based on what the, the needs they express are and their demands and that kind of thing. I was quite impressed as well how much time um, coach mentoring did put into that. I think that's a large part of, of the value that they provide. There's quite a lot of detail that goes into the, those matching forms. And they're still involved in this round of uh, matching mentors with mentees. Hopefully we'll have an ongoing relationship with them. They basically just sort of facilitate the matching uh, provide kind of the infrastructure, provide the, the training sessions at the start, which set the groundwork for what the mentor-mentee relationship should be like, and then do the uh, the assessment stage at the end. So let's just assume that a pair of mentor and mentee think, oh, this isn't going to work. Can they switch in between? Or how do they feed back that they would like to have another mentor or another mentee? That's a good question. I don't think that came up last year. So that was something we um, discussed at the beginning of the pilot discussing um, how the mentor, how the pilot would work. I don't believe it actually happened, but we accepted that as a possibility. And part of the reason we wanted them to have this contact with uh, Coach Mentoring was so there was someone they could always go to if there were problems. We would have tried to find a different mentor in case there were problems like that, either by asking one of the mentors who were in the program to, to double up, or I think we even had some backups. We had more people a volunteer to mentor then could be matched with with pairs so we're very fortunate in that way to have so much support from from mentors excellent well thank you very much for your time both of you sam and anya and i wish you all the best for the mentoring scheme and for the future will you let me actually say just one more thing because i would feel guilty if i if i didn't i just wanted to say um how grateful i am to all the people that volunteered uh, to help out in the program Sam and I might have organized it, but the people that actually make the program are the, uh, the people that volunteer to be part of it. Um, and I remember talking to Coach Mentoring uh, very early on, and they work with you know, many different organizations, and they were just stunned by how much enthusiasm they kept out of the, the mentors, how many people signed up for it, how ready to go people were in the training sessions. And I wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, it's really valuable and encourage people to, to continue. Any final thoughts from you, Sam? I think I'd probably echo that, that it's basically the people who make the RSC community and the, make the RSC mentoring scheme what it is. And that we were, again, put on a really great foundation by Anya setting up this. And so I'm really looking forward to, uh, to taking it forwards into 2023 and seeing how it goes then. As Sam and Anya mentioned, this mentoring scheme is set to continue. So don't worry if you're interested in signing up but miss getting a slot for the current mentoring round. There'll be other rounds to follow. 
Well, so much for the organization of the whole scheme, but what's it like for mentors and mentees? To find out, I met with Mark Turner from Newcastle University and James Graham from King's in London, who signed up as mentor-mentee in the pilot scheme. Here's what they had to say about it. Hello, Mark and James. Welcome to the show. Today's theme is uh, mentoring schemes, mentoring for research software engineers. But before we do that, James, can you introduce yourself? Yes, so I'm James Graham. At the time of recording, I've uh, recently started a new role as the head of RSE at King's College London uh, to start a new RSE group within the central e-research department. Before that, and at the time that uh, we did the mentoring scheme, I was Deputy Director of the Research Software Group at Southampton. And thanks very much for hosting this event here at King's College in no Bosch House. Hello, Mark. Hello again after the RSE conference. Hello again. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Mark Turner. I'm Head of Research Software Engineering at Newcastle University. I've previously been a trustee of the society, and as you've just alluded to, I was the uh, recently the program chair for the RSC conference back in September. The reason we're talking about mentoring scheme is uh, because you actually have been an active part in that. So you have been the mentor and the mentee. Who was which? So I was the mentee, and Mark was my mentor in the scheme. As well, actually, I also had a mentee of my own, so I was filling both of those roles in that scheme. I I was only a mentor during the program. Let's talk a little bit about the logistical aspects first before we go into what this is about. So how do you get a mentor? So both James and I signed up for opposite sides, I guess, of the mentoring scheme offered by the society that started about a year ago, a little bit more. At the time, as a mentor, I was asked to complete a, a form online to put myself forward to be a mentor into the scheme. I was basically put into a pool of possible mentors, and then a, a company that the society worked with did all of the matching. So going into it, I didn't know who I was going to get, what their background was, what career level they were at. Um, mm. I was asked a bunch of questions about my own experiences, my own career stage, and my own experiences of any previous mentoring schemes. But it was fairly light touch from a, a mentoring side. They just wanted to know some pretty basic details. And then into mm. the pool, I, I went. Uh, I guess the same was for you as a mentor, James. And how did you enter it as a mentee? As a mentee, yes, it, it was quite similar. Sign up through the society. And as a mentee, the questions were instead about what are some of the things you would like to talk about? What are you dealing with in your career at the moment? And, and what are the focuses you'd like to address? As Mark said, so we were matched up by the company that the society was working with and we were sent an email to introduce us. And that email also explained why the pairs had been put together, so that was quite helpful. All right, okay. It'll be interesting to find out how the company actually matches mentor and mentee. Do you know if that's actually a person going through that or is this uh, just that they, you know, like dating apps where it's going through an algorithm somewhat? I suspect that's a trade secret. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we're not going to tickle that out of them, are we? (laughs) So why did you join the mentoring scheme anyway? What was the motivation for being a mentor and being a mentee? I I think for the mentor side for myself, it was a way to give back to the community, uh, particularly the next Mm. generation of leaders. I'm acutely aware that I would not be in the position I'm in at Newcastle had it not been for the, let's say, informal mentoring of other senior leaders in this community. Their assistance, usually given in a pub, uh, (laughs) far less formal than a a proper mentoring scheme, but invaluable nonetheless. When you get as, as much advice and guidance as I received from people, you carry this burden of oh, I really need to, to give back and um, mm. it's, a, it's a welcome burden because it's something that I really care about and want to do because it's important for as I say the next generation of, of leaders. Uh, this has been a pilot project actually of the society hasn't it? It has although they've just opened the second year's call uh, for okay. volunteers for mentors and mentees. I would assume that means it was highly successful and they want to run it again. Okay James. Yes yeah, so from my perspective I was 
just moving into my first position of line management at the time. So coming from a background as an RSE. With that, I wanted to make sure that I was learning some of the things you need to do to do that effectively and to make sure I was being a good manager. But also the group at Southampton was growing quite quickly and I knew that we were going to have to make some changes to some of our structure and processes. Mm. I wanted the space to talk about that with someone who had gone through that process in the past. But you're also a mentor. How do you switch hats? I didn't actually find it that difficult to switch hats because it's a relatively small time commitment in either case. I think between the two, I only had one meeting a a couple of hours a month, probably in total, across being a mentee and being a mentor. And I guess there was quite good alignment in the things that I wanted to learn and the things which my mentee wanted to learn from me because he was relatively early in his career. The things I was wanting to learn about management, I was getting an opportunity to practice with some of the things (laughs) that he was looking for. Uh, Was it like an extended line management session almost? I wouldn't say quite that, but some of it was leaning in that direction, I guess. I suppose we should perhaps step back a little bit and talk about what mentoring is and what your understanding of mentoring is and how you approach that. Yeah, this is a tricky one because for me, that line between what's mentoring and what's coaching is a little fuzzy. I know they're very Mm. different areas. I think mentoring is trying to give your mentee either the skills or the thought processes to deal with situations themselves or, or to go out and get the information they need to deal with the scenario. Whereas I think coaching is very much a, if you do this, then that, then that, then this will happen. And it's very like hold someone's hand and walk them and actually almost do it for them in some sense. I was very keen going in that I didn't do that with James because it's important to set off in a direction, have a few stumbles along the way, learn Mm. a lot from those. I wouldn't call them mistakes, but you know, you learn a lot from just doing stuff. And I wanted to make sure that I was just asking probing questions and getting James to to think about things himself. So th- that was my style. Whether it was, it certainly sounds like it was useful, but whether it was uh, <laughs> perfect or not, I will leave that up to James. Yeah, I, I think that came across. And one of the things that was good about how the Society Mentoring Program was run with the support of this company, which specializes in mentoring, is they were really good at expectation setting and sort of mm. describing how the process could be most effective as mark says mentoring to me it it wasn't someone telling me what i should be doing it was the space to talk through some of the things i was thinking about and and having someone who had some expertise in that as i guess a sounding board to run those ideas past maybe tune some of them a bit work out Mm -hmm. which ones might be most successful in the situation i was in at the time Mm. turning it around a little bit What do you think mentoring is not? And what would you advise people to look out for? I would say it's definitely not someone telling you what to do. If you're going into it expecting to just be given some answers to something, that's Mm. not what we're talking about. That's not what mentoring is. I would second that. I think the reason that's not mentoring is that it it gives you the answer to that problem there and then, but they're not necessarily transferable skills to the next set of problems. It's more uh, about picking up a new mindset that allows you to deal with variant situations in the future rather than just getting through the here and now. So give us a feel how the mentoring session actually went. I mean, we don't have to have an entire rerun, but how is it structured? How do you go about it? Is there actually a fixed structure that's, or is it uh, any way that you wish it to be? No, I don't think there was a structure, really. I think it was very much we'd use the hour. It was our, an hour usually. I would just let James talk about whatever he wanted to talk about, introducing new topics or picking up ones from the previous session. I'd sometimes check in with not exactly actions, but like little takeaways and things that had been thought about last time and just ask whether thoughts had moved on or changed or Mm. anything like that. But generally it was new things every time with an overarching trail of thought across multiple sessions. It was was themed, but we were discussing different things each time. 
I mean, we're engineers, and as engineers, we're trying to find solutions. How easy or difficult is it to take off our solutions hat in these sessions? I don't think too difficult, at least with the sorts of things that I wanted to think about, because I, I was already coming into it with the solutions hat, well, with the engineer hat off, I guess, because right. what I wanted to think about was management and it was culture and, and things like that that hat was already off I think and you can really set it up to work in any way that works for both of you I think the on the engineering hat point I'd certainly already learned the lesson of having managed people for a few years managing people is really rewarding is good fun a lot of the time but it is messy like the idea that you can bring <laughs> engineering structure to you know messy situations is just a non-starter like I learned that the hard way probably in the first week of being a manager so by this point yeah. I was already well aware that we were talking about management issues and management sort of ideas no illusions that we would be talking about uh, messy problems how closer do you think you got James to getting to grips with line management issues through the mentorship I think what it brought to me was some guidance on what some of the core things were likely to be some of the issues that I might encounter or, or some space to think about what some of the values would be over the course of the year I feel that I did become much more comfortable as as a line manager but also achieve some of the changes that I, I wanted to make to the group could you give us an example of uh, what kind of changes you put in place at the start we didn't really have a mechanism for sharing knowledge between people in the team mm. other than just informally where, where someone would ask a question and, and we'd talk about it in a, a group meeting or something. So I put in place some knowledge transfer meetings where we'd make a space to talk about a particular topic that week or we'd talk about a new project we were going to take on and we'd use that to get everyone together who was interested in that so that I think filled a need that we had particularly as the group grew and we began to get in more people perhaps with less background in software it made that easier I think. I think what I got out of it was sort of a question that I don't ask myself enough of which is the why question so I, I would frequently use examples from my own uh, experience my own team James would be asking about how we do it at Newcastle which isn't to say like that you would do it exactly the same way but it's just another set of experiences mm. but then there would quickly be the follow-up question of why do you do that why do you do it that way uh, and it forces you to think actually why do we do it that way and, um, <laughs> you know a lot of the time there are good reasons and then other times you realize the, the reason we've done that is basically tradition or some other variant of that is the, mm. the answer of well that's how we've always done it which is never a good answer for anything I can't think of any of these specific examples, but there, there have definitely been moments where I've really thought through as a result of our mentoring chats, like, should I be changing that? Should, like, should I update our process on, on that area and that thing? Even from the mentor side, you, beyond the, just the, the obviousness of that rewarding, warm, fuzzy feeling of helping someone else, there mm. are very practical benefits you can get out of it. Actually, did you introduce any changes as a consequence of these conversations? I don't think any very specific things that I can really point to and go that mm. was because of mm. that but in the last 12 months at Newcastle we've also undergone a little bit of a restructure where we've brought really? in more um, senior positions and some new management roles all those thoughts churning around in my head from speaking to James have sort of filtered into that how are we going to restructure type conversation so there isn't a direct connection but I think indirectly definitely it's contributed to the way that the changes we mm. made this year Is the mentoring actually still ongoing? Are you still having that, if I may ask? It is. I think we sort of, well, not definitively paused, but I was pretty busy in the run-up to the conference. Oh. James has been very busy getting into his new role, but we have had a couple of quick messages over Slack to say we want to continue, but let's James settle in before we pick that up. So we're in a hiatus, but it will be coming back. So which brings me to the next question, which is, At what stage do you decide it's done and how do you end it? Will it ever end? Will it go on <laughs> until our <laughs> that's, last days? <laughs> that's a very good question. So in terms of the mentoring scheme itself, there was 
some guidance in when and how to do that wrap up formally once you've completed the the major strand then you put a cap on that and you say okay we've we've addressed this and i think we probably had reached that formally in the sense of finishing the strand that we were thinking about at the time but obviously new things come up since then I, i've changed role i've moved to kings that's bringing with it a whole another set of things i'm thinking about i'm certainly very happy to take up the offer of a, a mm. chat every now and then to collect my thoughts again as i've just said about you get out fresh ideas from being a mentor we're moving into a, a more informal stage is the way i think of it so the sort of official mentoring scheme part is has ended but basically there's a connection there that we can call upon as and when we need and maybe there'll be periods where we speak more frequently and maybe long periods where we feel we don't need to and that will ebb and flow as the situation warrants if you think back over i think you've been doing this for about a year haven't you yeah so if you think back over that year is there anything that you would have done differently and why the thing that i think i would do better is keeping in touch and planning meetings not more frequency perhaps but more regularity the idea is, is that the the frequency of the meetings and the scheduling of them is is mentee led which i think is is good that's mm. how it is because it is the mentee that's coming with the things they want to talk about but the thing i i would do differently i, I think i would probably make more effort to schedule those in advance so maybe schedule the next meeting at the end of the current one okay so they're like a mini structure almost you know yeah. so they have a entry in the calendar mark I kept thinking I wish I'd made either better notes or better, some better way of recording my thoughts because frequently as a mentor, you're, you're always on the hop because you don't know what James is going to say. You don't know what he's thinking about, what he's asking. Mm. So I've got to think of things that are useful, hopefully, and sensible answers mm. in that hour. But frequently we'd hang up the call and then I'd like go out in the evening, walk the dog, be walking around thinking, oh, I should have said that. Oh, I forgot to say this thing. I think most of the time those made it into the next mentoring session, but not always. And there was, would definitely be times I'd forgot, I'd sort of remembered to tell him something and then forgot that I needed to tell him <laughs> okay. that thing. So <laughs> I think better note keeping on my end to make sure I covered everything would be better. That goes hand in hand with, the, with James's point about keeping meetings regular. Some of the bigger gaps between meetings meant I'd remember I need to say something and then, you know, several weeks would go by and, and then I'd forget again. So, yeah, better note taking. So how does it all tie back to the Society of Research of Engineering? Do, you, do they actually keep in touch with you and say, well, how's the mentoring going and are you still doing it? Is there some kind of feedback? The mentoring scheme included a couple of checkpoints, I guess, as well as some seminars on a, a range of topics that were of interest to uh, mm. either or both the mentees and the mentors. I think that structure was quite useful in bringing people together. I think that's possibly something that they're going to restructure a little bit next time round though. Okay yeah because the next round is actually starting in, in autumn uh, 2022. I think the society needs to carry on doing this kind of thing and more. I think there's a bit of a I hasn't said gap, but there's a lot of quite senior leaders in the community now who are in positions of influence quite high up in their institutions, which is great, but it also makes them exceptionally busy. And so there's this little gap where the next generation of prominent leaders is waiting to step into those roles. It, it's happening and, and it's great to see. We just need it uh, more and faster. We need more leaders and we need more people who are willing to step into positions like being a trustee on the society, being able to volunteer for things like the conference and other big initiatives. And so the more people that go through the mentoring scheme, the more people feel empowered to interact with the society in a way that uh, mm. they feel they can contribute. So we need a, a lot more of that. There's a lot of members, but there needs to be more people willing to, to help out. Sometimes people talk about a training gap, but you're talking about something else, aren't you? You're talking about yeah, I mean, there is no substitute for experience. You can only get it by doing the job. Like you can't, mm. you can't make someone an incredible leader just through mentoring and just through reading mm. a book on being a leader. It doesn't work like that. You, you have to live it. You have to experience it. But trying to put more of these people forward for different things. So, for example, 
after the very first conference in 2016, I stood as a member of the association then and later became the trustee, the founding trustee. At the time, I wasn't managing anyone. I didn't get my first team together until 2019. Right. But that experience of being a trustee and being responsible in some small way for something that had some members was really formative in the way that I wanted to lead and be a manager mm. and, and lead a, a team of people. Things like the mentoring scheme where you can sort of nudge and persuade people to jump into positions and roles like that is um, invaluable for the community. It's quite an important point, actually, because now we have actually two main reasons for the mentoring scheme. A, playing ideas through your head and bouncing it back to somebody with more experience, but also growing leaders in the community mm -hmm. as a secondary role. Because it leads to my question is, under what circumstances should people actually apply for the mentoring scheme? Why should they join? There's a, a whole range of reasons that people should many of those will be different depending on your personal situation at the time where mm. you are in your career i would be surprised if there was anyone who wouldn't benefit from some mentoring in some way i think one of the difficulties we still have as a community although we're we're in the process of overcoming it is that we are still a bit of a niche in the research landscape having some mentoring from someone in a similar career track or, or with similar experiences mm. I think can be really beneficial. Obviously the society mentoring scheme exists but if you're looking for mentoring at a time that that isn't starting for that year I would say just go and try and find a mentor, go and talk mm. to someone who you think would be able to do that for you and I would have thought most people would say yes. I would echo all of that. I think another place to look would be would imagine most institutions run their own mentoring schemes of one kind or another. When I've had mentoring in the past, that was internal to Newcastle thing. So mm. obviously my mentor wasn't an RSE and wasn't even technical. The focus of it was becoming a leader and, and manager of people. Mm. So it was, it was someone in a, a sort of professional services capacity, but totally unrelated to computing. But yeah. it was still a very valuable relationship. So your mentor or mentee could come from anywhere. It doesn't have to be just technical. Mm. There's all these different services and schemes out there. You just got to look to find them. And as Jim says, I think the informal approach of just trying to find someone who you look up to in some way that's already in the community, it's a very friendly and open community. Uh, certainly, if anyone were to come up to me and ask, hey, can I spend a few sessions with you asking about this problem? I'd definitely say yes. I have full faith that most of the other leaders in the community would do likewise. Okay. Well, thank you both very much. I think it was a very interesting discussion about mentoring. I hope that people sign up to it or at least look at it uh, from the website that's available at the Society of Research on Software Engineering, the notes and the link for which can be found in the metadata for this episode. Okay. Thanks very much, James. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Oh, time's up. See you next time. But before I forget, this podcast is covered by the Creative Commons license. See ya.